Welcome to Six Degrees of Wiki, a podcast where two sisters find the six degrees of separation between Wikipedia articles that don't seem to have anything in common. I'm Rosanna. And I'm Nikki. Today we'll fall into a Wikipedia spiral where we have just six rounds to figure out how the first degree could possibly be connected to the last while learning all sorts of peculiar facts along the way. Let's get started. Today we are spiraling from the Great Emu War to yellow journalism. I chose the Great Emu War because it's something I've heard of before and it always sounded ridiculous. <laughs> and listeners, it is as ridiculous as it sounds. <laughs> Great. This is maybe the most hilarious degree I've ever read. It's fantastic. So, Rosanna, what do you think about these two things? Do you even know what they are? Have you heard of them? I barely know what an emu is. I don't know why there was an emu war. I don't know if emu war means people were fighting over emus or the emus were actually fighting. Okay. Which which one do you think? I find it hard to believe that the emus would be organized enough to have their own war. So I feel like people must have been fighting over them. But that also seems weird. Doesn't it? It does. Doesn't it? <laughs> it does. And I've never heard of yellow journalism. I don't know what that is. The only thing I can think is that it has something to do with a country, like the color yellow has to do with a country. Round one. The Great Emu War was a military operation in Australia in late 1932 because there were so many emus, they were attacking crops. Well, <laughs> eating all the crops, not attacking. Okay. <laughs> and they wanted to try to cull the amount of them. Yellow journalism is unethical journalism using sensationalist headlines and not quite true facts. Oh. Rosanna, do you see yeah. anything these two items may have in common? I mean, kind of, because I can imagine oh, okay. that the headlines surrounding the Great <laughs> Emu War were extremely <laughs> sensationalized, with good reason. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so let's learn about the Great Emu War and what the heck it was. First, emus. Emus are a large flightless bird, and they're indigenous to Australia. They're actually pretty creepy looking. <laughs> they're kind of ostrichy looking, mm -hmm. but scarier. And the Great Emu War was a nuisance wildlife management military operation that happened in Australia in late 1932. There was a lot of public concern about the number of emus that were, quote, running amok in the Campion <laughs> District of Western Australia, eating a lot of crops. It was an unsuccessful attempt to curb the population. It employed soldiers armed with Lewis guns, which are machine guns. <gasps> what? Which is the main reason the media adopted the name Emu War when they talked about it. Because mm -hmm. they were using machine guns against birds. That's... Seems like an overreaction. Even with machine guns. The Australian people <laughs> did not win the Great Emu War. <laughs> they lost. So what you're telling me is it's not people versus people over emus. And it's not emus versus no. emus. It's people versus emus. Yep. And the emus won. And the won. emus won. Yep. How? Did they not actually shoot them? Let's Let's talk about... <laughs> The circumstances surrounding this. So some background on how it all got started. Right after World War I, there were a huge number of ex-soldiers from Australia, a bunch of British veterans that were given land by the government hmm. to take up farming, mm -hmm. all in Western Australia, usually in marginal areas. And then with the onset of the Great Depression in 1929, the farmers were encouraged to increase their wheat crops, and the government promised and failed to deliver subsidies mm. to assist these farmers. So wheat prices started to really fall. By October 1932, matters were becoming really intense. Farmers weren't getting the money they were promised to grow this crop they had been told to grow. They were very unhappy. And then, after the prices started to fall, about 20,000 emus started to migrate after their breeding season, <laughs> coming to inland regions. <laughs> So there was all this cleared land, lots of water supplies being made available for the livestock of these farmers. Mm -hmm. 
So emus found, hey, this is a great place to live, isn't mm -hmm. it? So they started to go there into the farm territories and eat the crops, spoil the crops, leaving really big gaps in fences where rabbits could come in. So just making it so much worse. So some of the farmers slash egg soldiers got together and they visited the Minister of Defense, Sir George Pierce. These soldiers had been in World War I. They knew about the effectiveness of machine guns. What? They suggested that they get machine guns <laughs> for, to solve this problem. Because machine guns solve every problem, right? Well, I mean, somehow. So the minister said, sure, why not? <laughs> you guys, you do you. Some have said that the government was trying to make it look like they were helping the Western Australian farmers. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason they said yes to this. <laughs> but it got so ridiculous toward the end. There was even a cinematographer from Fox Movie Tone hired to get some of this on film. It was oh just... Oh, my gosh. It was insane. <laughs> there were some conditions around this as well. The farmers were supposed to pay for any troops and any ammunition that were going to be used in this whole endeavor. So, the first attempt. <laughs> Let me tell you about it. November 2nd, the troops traveled to Campion, where they saw 50 emus. The birds were out of range of the guns, so the local settlers tried to herd the emus into an ambush. But the birds just split off into small groups and ran, so they couldn't really be targeted. Wow. So they still tried to shoot at them with these machine guns. And a second round of gunfire was able to kill, quote, a number of birds. <laughs> Later that same day, there was a small flock that they ran into, and perhaps a dozen birds were killed. Th these were ex-soldiers, right? With machine guns. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Emus are fast and they can dodge, apparently. They also have really skinny necks, so I guess there's that. That's true. All right. Two days later, November 4th, Major Meredith, the guy in charge of these troops. I I mean, what would you put on your resume after something like this? <laughs> General in the Great Emu War. <laughs> <laughs> so he set up an ambush near a local dam. And they spotted more than a thousand emus heading toward their position. So this time the gunners waited until, I guess, till they could see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> and then they opened fire. The gun jammed after only 12 birds were killed. What? And the remainder just scattered before they could be shot. They didn't see any more birds that day. Two days later, <laughs> army observers noted that, quote, each... <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just so ridiculous. Each pack seems to have its own leader now. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> a big black-plumed bird, which stands fully six feet high and keeps watch while his mates carry out the work of destruction and warns them of our approach, end quote. What? So the emus had a lookout? <laughs> Apparently for the captain. <laughs> just... <laughs> what? <laughs> it's just ridiculous. <laughs> So the so the emus are smarter than the soldiers. I think they might have been. Wow. At one point, Major Meredith uh, mounted one of the guns on a truck to try to keep up with the emus. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this was ineffective because the truck couldn't keep up with the birds. What? And the ride was so rough that the gunner couldn't fire any shots because it's Australia, in the middle of Australia. Oh my gosh. How fast were these emus running? <laughs> I don't know, but they were better on the rough terrain than the truck was, apparently. Wow. All right. November 8th, my birthday. By this time, 2,500 rounds of ammunition had been fired. The number of birds killed is uncertain. Like 25, right? <laughs> One estimate was 50 birds. Wow. <laughs> Other accounts were 200 to 500, which is what the settlers said. Which is still not very many for 2,500 rounds. Here's the best part. Major Meredith wrote a report. <laughs> and it noted that his men had suffered no casualties. From, from the emus. <laughs> from fighting the emus. From the unarmed emus. Yeah, yeah. the unarmed emus. Wow. They were just trying to run away. So as you might expect, there was a bunch of really negative coverage in the media about all this. 
Yeah. Pierce, the minister, withdrew the military personnel and the guns on November 8th. It had only been, what, like six days? Yeah. They were out doing this. So the military withdrew. The emu attacks on crops continued, as expected. Farmers asked for support again because there was hot weather and drought, so the emus were coming even more into their farms for water. Mm -hmm. James Mitchell was the premier of Western Australia, and he supported the renewal of military assistance against the emus. (laughs) At the same time, a report from the base commander in this area indicated that 300 emus had been killed in the initial operation. I don't think anyone actually believed this was true. Mm -hmm. But so November 12th, it's still all within a very short period of time. Wow. The Minister of Defense approved approved a resumption of military efforts with poor Major Meredith back in charge. (laughs) He's like, I just want to go home. I don't want to do this anymore. I never want to see another emu again. (laughs) So the second attempt, November 13th. The military had a little bit more success over the first two days. They killed 40 emus. Mm -hmm. The third day, less successful. But by December 2nd, the soldiers were killing about 100 emus per week, which is a lot more than they had been before. That is progress. Meredith was recalled on December 10th, and he claimed in his report that they had killed 986 emus With 9,860 rounds, so 10 rounds from this machine gun per emu. He claimed 2,500 were wounded that had died as a result of the injuries they had sustained. So that was the end of the emu war. Here's the aftermath, which is my interesting fact. Farmers, they again request military assistance. 1934, 1943, 1948, turned down by the government in those cases. Instead, they set up a bounty system that had originally been started in 1923, and so they continued it. And this was way more effective. It killed (gasps) 57,034 bounties, so that many birds were claimed over a six-month period in 1934. Oh, my gosh. So way more effective than the soldiers with machine guns. So, you know, why not hire actual hunters to do this work? That's kind of what I was thinking, too. Yeah. And then throughout the the following years, they started setting up exclusion barrier fencing, which is a very specific type of fencing, which kept out emus and dingoes and rabbits. Why they didn't do this in the first place? Because that fencing was around in 1930? I have no idea. Yeah, I feel like if you take the fencing versus the machine gun rounds, yeah, fences seem like a, a better option. <laughs> From what it sounds like, the farmers never actually ended up paying for the troops or the ammunition. The government ended up absorbing that cost, even though that was one of the conditions. Uh, Because it was useless. Yeah, it's ridiculous. (laughs) I wouldn't pay for it either. And of course, as you'd expect, there were lots of, there's lots of controversy about conservation of animals and why they were killing off so many animals. I would think there would be tons of people saying, hey, just because you don't want them there doesn't mean you should just kill them. Figure out a better way. Yeah. So that is the Great Emu War. That was great. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. (laughs) But not as much as the emus, because I just feel like they were laughing back in their little emu circles at night. I feel like that has to be true. Yeah. Round two. Rosanna, Mm -hmm. what do you think the next degree is between Great Emu War and Yellow Journalism? Um... Nothing I wrote down seems like it would connect them. <laughs> I wrote down scary ostrich running amok. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's a Wikipedia article. <laughs> I wrote down machine guns. <laughs> I wrote down 1932. <laughs> <laughs> really reaching here. Okay, Nikki, I can't think of anything... That would relate to journalism. Okay. Except for the fact that politicians often show up in the media. So my guess is Sir George Pierce. All right. Your guess of Sir George Pierce is incorrect. Okay. That would have been weird if it was right. 
<laughs> the next degree is nuisance wildlife management. No, I wrote that down. <laughs> I just couldn't figure out how that would be anything. <laughs> Man, I should have said that. So nuisance wildlife management is a fancy term for when they want to selectively remove problem individuals of populations of specific wildlife species. Sometimes called wildlife damage management, wildlife control, or animal damage control, which is my next band name. <laughs> animal damage control. So some species of wildlife become used to human presence, mm -hmm. causing property damage or risking zoonosis, which is when diseases move from pets to humans. Oh, yeah. Common wildlife pets. Armadillos, skunks, boars, foxes, squirrels, snakes, rats, groundhogs, beavers, possums, raccoons, bears, moles, deer, mice, coyotes, bears, ravens, seagulls, woodpeckers, and pigeons. What? So there are a lot. That is a lot. It is a lot. And those are the common ones. Wow. So some of these species, as you might expect, are protected by state or federal regulations. And you actually have to have a permit to control the population. Wildlife are usually pests only in certain situations, like when their numbers become excessive in a particular area. Sometimes human-induced changes in the environment can cause increased numbers of a species. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to guess that it's usually humans' fault. <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'd, I'd say probably 90% of the time. So there are four steps that lead to a successful nuisance wildlife control program. Number one. Correctly identify the species causing the problem. Oh, my gosh. Which is actually harder than it may seem. <laughs> <laughs> but kind of important. <laughs> yes, pretty important. Number two, alter the habitat if you can to make the area less mm. attractive to the mm -hmm. wildlife pest. Number three, use a control method appropriate to the location, time of year, and other environmental conditions. Number four, monitor the site for reinfestation in order to determine if additional control is necessary. There are ways to do it humanely, so there are laws around a lot of this as well. Round three. All right, Rosanna, what is the next degree between nuisance wildlife management and yellow journalism? He, well, here's the thing. I don't know. Also, I sort of have this connection with journalists needing to be controlled through nuisance Nuisance wildlife management. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining giant traps for paparazzi. Yes. <laughs> As a rule, <laughs> you know, there, there, there's this type of journalist that you definitely want less uh -huh. of. Yes. Um. So if it can't be that somehow, mm -hmm. I feel like it has to be one of the animals you listed because that's pretty much all I wrote down. <laughs> <laughs> I said them really fast. You really did. I didn't get them all down. <laughs> Let's stick with the wacky animal theme and go with armadillo. <laughs> armadillo. Your guess of armadillo is incorrect. Yeah. It wasn't any of those animals. Okay. Was it reinfestation? No. Can I guess again? That's a weird thing to <laughs> crap on. You cannot guess anymore. I have no idea what it is. Your guesses are exhausted. The next degree is zoonosis. <sighs> okay. Okay, so zoonosis is when pets give humans their sicknesses? Yes. Okay. When infectious diseases that can be naturally transmitted between animals are transmitted, usually between vertebrates and humans. I'll give you some types of zoonosis first. Uh, there's direct zoonosis, when the disease is directly transmitted from an animal to a human through the air, like the flu, or through bites and saliva, like rabies. Okay. There's also where transmission can occur between an intermediate species that's related to the vector, which carries the pathogen without getting infected, so a carrier animal. Okay, like a rat. Yeah, that passes on to a human. And there's also the opposite, reverse zoonosis, when a human infects an animal. Okay. They didn't have an example for that one, but... That's probably good. Yeah. <laughs> Some examples of zoonosis diseases, the Ebola virus. Ah. And salmonella, salmonellanosis. Yeah. 
and uh, Zika fever. Oh. From mosquitoes. Yeah. HIV was originally a zoonotic disease. Really? Transmitted to humans, yep, in the early part of the 20th century. Though it's since mutated to a human-only disease. To a human-only? Mm-hmm. But it didn't used to be. Right. And so there's still, like, you've heard of, like, cat AIDS, so that's that's a completely different disease. Hmm. Is human AIDS. That is very weird. Isn't it? Yeah. Most strains of influenza, or the flu, that affect infect humans are human diseases, but many strains of swine and bird flu are zoonoses. Oh. And those sometimes recombine with human strains and cause pandemics, which are really bad. Yes. Like the 1918 Spanish flu or the 2009 swine flu, those pandemics. Huh. There's also the tinea solium, otherwise known as the pork tapeworm. Oh, that sounds, sounds horrible. Disgusting. <laughs> and that's a tropical disease. Ugh. <laughs> Passed from animals to humans. Ugh. It really, really sounds so gross. gross. This why you should always vacation in Alaska. Don't go tropical. <laughs> so I'm going to give you some numbers. There are 1,415 pathogens known to infect humans. 61% of those were zoonotic. Wow, that's which a is lot. a lot. So basically just stay away from animals if you don't want to ever get sick. And other people. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and most human diseases originated in animals. Yeah, I think I've heard that. Yeah, but only diseases that routinely involve animal to human transmission, like rabies, mm -hmm. are considered direct zoonosis. Okay. Interesting fact about zoonosis. Interesting is in, like, kind of scary. <laughs> Great. Close contact with cattle can lead to cutaneous anthrax infection. What? Where you inhale anthrax. It's more common for workers in slaughterhouses and tanneries and woolen mills. Mm -hmm. But still, they can get anthrax. That's horrible. Also, another reason to stay away from reindeer if you go to Finland, because I think a lot of them have anthrax, too. What? Seriously? Well, it's a naturally occurring thing, yeah. But they're just, like, showing up at people's houses every Christmas and just leaving anthrax everywhere? <laughs> That's very dangerous. This should have been our Christmas episode. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Anthrax, Anthrax reindeer. reindeer. <laughs> Rudolph the Anthrax Reindeer. Oh, it's a new classic. <laughs> <laughs> Had a white powdered nose. Oh, now it sounds like he's from Scarface. <laughs> <laughs> also, ladies out there, if you're pregnant, stay away from sheep who have recently given birth. You can get chlamydiosis <gasps> yes that's what it sounds like Whoa. or enzootic abortion <gasps> which can cause just a spontaneous abortion oh my gosh just from yeah from getting stuff from sheep also you can get toxoplasmosis or listeriosis from sheep wow also toxoplasmosis from handling cat feces i've heard about the cats yeah yeah, but the sheep I didn't know about. Oh, that's horrible. Pretty creepy. That was a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> Round four. Rosanna? Yes. What is the next degree between zoonosis, the anthrax reindeer, <laughs> and yellow journalism? Okay, I think I might be on to something. Okay. But I can't put my finger on it. So you're not really on to something? Okay, okay. Stop. Let me finish. <laughs> I feel like in a lot of these sicknesses that you listed, there were probably sensationalized news reports about them. Ah, if, okay. It feels like that'd be a good connection because, okay, you know, once they get a story, they just push and push and puff it up and puff it up and it's gotten worse and worse, Yeah, you know, over time. That everything gets sensationalized. So I feel like if you're talking about, like, some of the things you said, Ebola, that's been sensationalized, pandemics, oh, yeah. the flus, HIV, all that stuff, they just blow it up. Not that it's not important, yeah. but they, it's just too much, you know? Yeah. It becomes hyperbole. Yeah. So I feel like it's probably one of those things. Okay. 
And I, which one are you going to go with? I, I think, uh, I mean, there are a lot of choices. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm probably going to go with the one that seems easiest to sensationalize. Okay. So my guess is swine flu. Swine flu. Your guess of swine flu is incorrect, but you were definitely on the right track. Yay! Okay, what was it? The next degree is the Spanish flu. Ah, that was going to be my second guess. Mm -hmm. I was right there, though. And anyone that was a teenager in the 2000s is like, I only know about that because Edward the Vampire in Twilight had the Spanish flu. Oh, is that what killed him? That's how, That's why I know about it. Nikki, I wouldn't tell many people that. Strap in, folks. This one's a big one. Oh, boy. The Spanish flu happened from January 1918 to December 1920. It's colloquially known as the Spanish flu. It didn't actually originate there. And you'll find out why pretty soon. It was an unusually deadly influenza pandemic. But the first of the two pandemics involving H1N1 flu. Oh. Yeah. How many people do you think get infected around the world? Um, let's see, 1918. A million? 500 million <gasps> people were infected around the world. 500 million. Wow. Including people on remote Pacific Islands and in the Arctic. What? How'd they get it? It got everywhere. It passed really, really well. This was a very effective disease. It resulted in the deaths of 50 to 100 million people. Oh, my. Which was 3 to 5% of the world's population <gasps> at the time. Wow. One of the deadliest natural disasters in human history. So here's the weird thing about this flu. Usually, flu outbreaks disproportionately kill young people, the elderly, or already weakened patients. Right. The 1918 pandemic mostly killed previously healthy young adults. What? They don't know the exact reason, but there are some theories, and here they are. One is that the specific variant of this virus had a really, really aggressive nature. There was a group of researchers that later recovered the virus from the bodies of frozen victims and found that in animals it caused a really rapidly progressive respiratory failure and death through what's called a cytokine storm, which is an overreaction of the body's immune system. So the stronger your immune system, like a young adult oh. who's healthy, the more aggressive it can be on your body. Oh, and so it just ravaged their bodies. It, the descriptions are pretty unpleasant, but there's a lot of gross blood coming out of places you don't want blood coming out of. I mean, that sounds like biologically intentional. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know? So the weaker immune systems of children and the elderly couldn't be as aggressive because they weren't as strong. And so it didn't kill them nearly as quickly. Wow. There's an alternate recent theory. And that's that the viral infection itself wasn't more aggressive than previous influenza, but that the special circumstances of the epidemic, which happened right at World War I, was malnourishment, overcrowded medical camps and hospitals, oh, yeah. poor hygiene, all the soldiers. Yeah. And so that promoted what they called bacterial super infection that killed most of the victims. Wow. Usually after being on their deathbed for quite a long time. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. Also, in 1918, older adults, especially the elderly, may have had a partial protection caused by a different flu pandemic that happened in 1889, known as the Russian flu, which may have given them some protection against the Spanish flu. Oh. So that could have also helped out at least the elderly population. There was also a second wave of the flu that was much, much deadlier than the first wave. The first wave looked like typical flus. Mm -hmm. Most of those at risk were sick and elderly, even though younger, healthier people were recovering easily. The virus then mutated. And that's when the young adults really, really got in trouble. Mm -hmm. Within a month of the second wave, it just stopped. Usually pathogenic viruses become less lethal with time because the hosts of more dangerous strains tend to die out. Right. And that's pretty much what happened. It, it happened really fast it was over really fast. They don't actually know where the source came from. Some theorize it was a hospital camp in France where 100,000 soldiers passed through each day. Whoa. So these were young, healthy men. So the, the very victims right. that are most likely to die from it. And they're going 
all over the world. They right. were going all over the world. So they were just spreading it everywhere. I mean, it was just a perfect storm for this. I mean, this sounds like you'd see a movie made now that's about mm -hmm. a biological weapon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, making oh, yeah. it on purpose to do it this way. And amazingly, just did it naturally. That's why Just had just the right circumstances to catch and go everywhere. There is a claim that by late 1917, the year before this pandemic, there had already been a first wave of it in at least 14 U.S. military camps. Oh. So it's possible that it started out on a very small scale and then spread across the world as these soldiers were deployed all over the world. Right. Some say it may have originated in East Asia which is a common place where transmission of diseases from animals to humans happen because of dense living conditions. So here's why it's called the Spanish flu, even though the Spain is not one of the places they thought it may have originated from. Yeah. During World War I, there were a lot of censors for the media. They minimized early reports of the illness and mortality in Germany, the UK, France, the US. However, in Spain, Spain was neutral in World War I. Oh. And so papers were free to report uh. about the epidemic and its effects. Also, King Alfonso XIII, their king, was very sick with the, th with the flu. Oh. So this created the false impression that Spain was hard hit more than any other country. So they called it the Spanish flu because they thought that's where it was the worst, when it definitely was everywhere. That's definitely like Christopher Columbus calling Native Americans Indians. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's just very wrong. Poor Spain. It wasn't their fault. <laughs> and and still to this day, <laughs> they're still calling it that. <laughs> That's dumb. Interesting facts. If you can call facts about mortality interesting. Well. Which I do. Nobody said pleasant, but yes, could be interesting. Yes. The Spanish flu killed up to 20% of those infected. Wow. Usually... The flu kills about 0.1%. Yeah. About 10 to 20% of those who were infected died, with about a third of the po world population infected. A third of the world. Wow. The case fatality ratio, that means that 3 to 6% of the entire global population died. Wow. That's a lot of people. Not really. I mean, there was probably no one that didn't know someone that died. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it got to the Arctic, that's crazy. How? How did it get there? Somebody on a ship. I mean, I think the only way that this could have happened this way, no matter how it started, is because of the war. That's the, that's how it got passed. That, yeah. That's the only thing that makes sense. If there hadn't been a war, it probably would have still eventually gotten to a lot of places, but not at that rate, not at that severity. The Spanish flu is said to have killed more people in 24 weeks than AIDS killed in 24 years. <gasps> Whoa. And more in a year than the Black Death killed in a century. Oh, my gosh. Here are some specific numbers in certain places. In Tahiti, 13% of the population died during one month. Whoa. In Samoa, the population was 38,000. 22% of their population died within two months. What? That's a lot. Also, in 1918, life expectancy was already not great because of infectious diseases. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy for your average person was about 40. That doesn't mean that people only lived to 40. It's because there was such a high infant mortality rate. Right. So basically, if you made it to 20, you're probably going to make it to 60. Right. But... During the first year of the pandemic, life expectancy in the U.S. dropped by 12 years. Whoa. 12 years. Wow. Academic named Andrew Price Smith has made an argument that the virus helped tip the balance of power at the end of the war toward the Allied cause. Oh. Because the viral waves hit the central powers before they hit the Allied powers. Oh. And because morbidity and mortality in Germany and Austria much higher than Britain and France. So the Spanish flu may have won World War I. Oh my gosh. That's insane. <laughs> it not only decimated the population, it possibly changed the outcome of a world war. Round five. All right, Rosanna, that was a big one. That was what do you think one. the next degree is between Spanish flu 
and yellow journalism? I think it might be media censorship. Media censorship. Your guess of media censorship is incorrect. Oh, I felt really good about that one. <laughs> <laughs> the next degree is King Alfonso the Thirteenth of Spain. No, mine made a lot more sense than that. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> King Alfonso lived from 1886 to 1941. He died at the age of 54. He was king of Spain from birth until the proclamation of the Second Republic in 1931, 10 years before he died. His mother, Christina of Austria, was regent until he assumed full powers on his 16th birthday in 1902. That seems like a reasonable age to rule a country. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> I think back to when I was 16, and I totally could have ruled a country. I definitely been should fine. not have been given any power at that age. <laughs> <laughs> During the Regency, it was 1898, Spain lost its colonial rule over not just Cuba, Puerto Rico, but also Guam and the Philippines. They lost them all to the U.S. because of the Spanish-American War. Yikes. Just lost them. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I'm 12, I'm going to be king soon. Oh, wait, what about all my colonies? <laughs> They're just gone now. Mm. So he married Princess Victoria Eugenie of Battenberg, whom he met in 1905 when he visited the UK and stayed in Buckingham Palace. She was the Scottish-born daughter of King Edward's youngest sister, Princess Beatrice. She was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Now, not everybody wanted them to get married. She was a Protestant. Huh. She was willing to become a Catholic, though, to marry him. Oh, but her her brother was a hemophiliac, and so there was a 50% chance that she was a carrier. So apparently that was enough to not let someone get married, I guess. Oh, because the heir could have it and die. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> their wedding was marked by an assassination attempt on Alfonso and Victoria. Awesome. By Catalan anarchist Mateu Morale. As the wedding procession was going back to the palace, he threw a bomb from a window <gasps> at the procession. It killed or injured several bystanders and members of the procession. Mm -hmm. The royalty people were fine. Isn't that the way? Mm-hmm. So Alfonso and his wife had two girls and two boys. Both boys inherited hemophilia. <sighs> Yikes. Alfonso blamed his wife. Of course. Because it was totally her fault because she made that decision. And so he started distancing himself from his queen and having mistresses and illegitimate children. He fathered six illegitimate kids. Wow. Yeah. One was actually before he got married, but the rest were after this this problem. Mm -hmm. During World War One, because he had a family connection with both sides and the popular opinion was really divided, mm -hmm. Spain stayed neutral. And then Alfonso got the Spanish flu. Well, the flu at that point. Right. <laughs> and as I said, because Spain was neutral, there was no wartime censorship. And so the papers reported on it. In 1920, Spain entered a war called the Rif War, R-I-F. And it was a very lengthy, yet victorious uh, <laughs> war. They were trying to preserve their rule over northern Morocco. Mm. But there were a lot of people criticizing the monarchy, saying the war was this unforgivable loss of money and lives. I mean, aren't they all, though? Really, yeah. So here's some not-so-great things about Alfonso. You've already told me a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I already don't like him. Yeah, here's stuff that affected a whole bunch of people. He liked to play favorites with his generals. Sure. One of his most favored generals was... Manuel Fernandez Silvestri. And in 1921, Silvestri went to the top of the Rift Mountains in Morocco. Alfonso sent him a telegram, and the first line said, quote, Hurrah for real men, end quote. Wow. Which urged Sylvester not to retreat when he was experiencing major difficulties. So he stayed the course, led his men into the Battle of Annual, which is one of Spain's worst defeats. It gets... It gets worse, and you're really not going to like him after this. Alfonso was on holiday in the south of France when this happened, and he was informed of the disaster of the annual while he was playing golf. Apparently, what he said was, chicken meat is cheap, <gasps> before continuing his game of golf. What? Uh-huh. No compassion. When he's the one who urged them to do it. 
I don't know if it's true or not, but the fact they did it in the first place, I mean, there's proof about the telegram. Right. So he stayed in France. He didn't go back to Spain to comfort the families of the soldiers, which people found cold and callous. <laughs> what a surprise. In 1922, uh, the Cortez, which was kind of the the royalty board. I, I don't know how to really describe it in terms of the monarchy. He went to them when he got crowned, things like that. They started an investigation into who was responsible for the annual disaster and quickly discovered evidence that the king had been one of the main supporters of Silvestri's advance into the Rift Mountains. Mm -hmm. So not so great. In August 1923, Spanish soldiers that were supposed to leave for Morocco mutinied. A lot of them in Malaga just refused to board the ships that were supposed to take them to Morocco. Wow. And in Barcelona, there were huge crowds of left-wingers staging anti-war protests where they burned the Spanish flag and the flag of the Rift Republic they waved around instead. Wow. So the country they were fighting against, they waved that flag. Wow. That's mm -hmm. really bad. This led to a coup d'etat. Where General Miguel Primo de Rivera seized power in this military coup. He ruled as a dictator with the support of Alfonso until 1930. What? <laughs> what? Apparently, Alfonso supported him because he was afraid that the Cortez report about his involvement in the annual disaster would be publicized. Okay. Yeah. Just <laughs> not great decisions, this guy. No. As you'd expect, there was some fallout. <laughs> there were some economic problems, and he was generally unpopular. So Miguel Primo de Rivera resigned as prime minister, and Alfonso, his public ally, shared all this dislike in the public. He left Spain after there were municipal elections in April 1931. They overwhelmingly ousted him and basically ended the monarchy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have to be pretty bad if you end yeah. a monarchy in a country. Mm -hmm. And they ended it pretty peacefully, just with elections. They're just like, dude, you're out. and We don't yeah. care what you have to uh -huh. say about it. We're voting. Or any of your family forever more. Right. <laughs> this, is, this is just the no end. More family rule. Go somewhere else. Yeah. In 1931, Alfonso was accused by the Cortez of high treason. <laughs> This was later repealed in 1938, but, I mean, the damage was done. In 1932, two of his sons renounced their claims to the throne. <laughs> wow. Changed their names, went into hiding. Yep. In 1936, civil war broke out. Oh. And he sent his son Juan to participate in the uprising what? to try to get the power back. Juan was arrested and expelled from the country before he even got there. Ugh. Well, at least he didn't get stabbed. So on January 15th, 1941, Alfonso XIII abdicated his rights to the now defunct Spanish throne in favor of Juan. <laughs> and then he died in Rome the next month. He's like, fine, I don't want to be a king anyway. It was just so weird. That's really terrible. Yeah. What a terrible ruler. Interesting fact to lighten the mood. <laughs> just after he was born, Alfonso was carried naked to the Spanish prime minister on a silver tray. Oh my gosh. No wonder he ended up the way he was. Yeah, it, it started that way. Jeez. Round six. All right, Rosanna, last chance. What is the final degree between King Alfonso the Thirteenth of Spain and yellow journalism? I'm struggling between two things. Okay. I think they both could work. The problem is one of them I already guessed... <laughs> And you said no, <laughs> but it came up again. Okay. Okay. So. Is it armadillos? It is. it is. It's armadillos. <laughs> because they're real popular in Spain. No. So censorship is one of them. Mm hmm But also it could be anti-war protests. It also could be a third correct option that I didn't think of. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I have to stay the course and go with censorship. Your guess of censorship is sadly incorrect. <sighs> what is it? The next degree is the Spanish-American War. <sighs> you know, censorship really would work in this instance it as would. well. But it didn't. But it didn't. 
Let's learn about this war. Fine, let's. <laughs> this is one of those wars that I have remember, like I've heard about on the periphery of history, but I never actually knew when it was or anything about it. Yeah. So it was interesting to read it and find out what the heck it was. It was fought between the United States and Spain in 1898, oh, mainly over Cuban independence, oh. which I did not know. I did not. So there had been revolts happening in Cuba for quite a few years against Spanish rule, and the U.S. later backed these revolts. Public opinion in the U.S. was agitated. There was a lot of anti-Spanish propaganda, led by newspaper publishers like Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, using yellow journalism to call for war. Ah. Uh. The business community across the U.S. had just recovered from a deep depression, though not the Great Depression. And they were afraid the war would reverse the gains they had made, and they just lobbied vigorously against going to war. The United States Navy armored cruiser, the USS Maine, mysteriously sank in the Havana Harbor. Hmm. I'm sure you've heard, remember the Maine. I have That's heard where it that. came from. Oh. I had no context for that. The U.S. conducted an investigation into this uh, mysterious <laughs> sinking of their ship and found that the Spanish had caused an explosion to sink it. The Spanish conducted an investigation into this and found that it was something internal in the ship that exploded and caused it to sink. Mm. They each found the other one at fault. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows why it actually sank. Mm. So after the main was destroyed, New York City newspaper publishers, Hearst and Pulitzer, decided the Spanish were to blame, and they just publicized this theory as fact in their papers. Oh. They both used really sensational sensationalistic and astonishing accounts of atrocities committed by the Spanish in Cuba using headlines like Spanish murderers and remember the main. Wow. Spanish the murderers. The press exaggerated what was happening and how the Spanish were treating the Cuban prisoners. The stories were based on factual accounts, but usually the articles were embellished and written with just really incendiary language, causing emotional and heated responses among readers. Yeah. Which feels like something that's coming back to the country. Yeah, it's kind of a mess. Yep. Basically, clickbait is what they did. Yes. Hmm? I hate that's clickbait. Journalism. Oh my gosh. Me too. So annoying. There were lots of, lots of political pressures from the Democratic Party in the U.S. trying to get Republican President William McKinley to start a war. He did not want it. He wanted to avoid it. Because he wasn't an idiot? Yeah. He signed a joint congressional resolution demanding that the Spanish withdraw from Cuba, and they authorized the president to use military force to help Cuba gain independence on April 20th, 1898. In response, Spain severed diplomatic relations with the U.S. Ooh. on the next day. And on that day, the U.S. began a blockade of Cuba because they had a big navy and mm -hmm. it was pretty easy. Yep. And Cuba's pretty easy to surround. This started a 10-week war fought in the Caribbean and Cuba and in the Pacific in the Philippines and Guam. Wow. Now, U.S. naval power is pretty serious, even back then. Yeah. So they won. This resulted in the 1898 Treaty of Paris. I don't know why they went to Paris to what? negotiate that this, but that's where they went. That doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so, obviously, it had terms favorable to the U.S., allowed it to temporarily control Cuba, and also ceded ownership of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippine Islands to the U.S. Ah. Which is pretty serious. Yeah. And the cessation of the Philippines involved payment by the U.S. of $20 million to Spain to cover infrastructure Spain had paid for over the years. Uh, okay. Which is $589 million today. That's a lot. Yeah. So you may have wondered why the U.S. was so intent on helping Cuba get its independence. I actually was wondering that. Is it the cigars? Why could that be? Is there any chance that Cuba is the one big piece of land between the U.S. and Panama where they wanted to build a canal? Uh, I wondered if that was that. Could that be it? Yeah. I think that might have been it. It was worth those millions so they, of dollars. they would need some naval protection in that area. They had already been talking about a canal either in Nicaragua or Panama. Mm-hmm. So it just uh, 
just seemed convenient. Wow. And this whole time, it, at first the Cubans were like, oh, the U.S. is going to help us. And then they thought, oh, I wonder what they want. <laughs> Out of the goodness of our own them. hearts. And they didn't have the power to do anything. They were already under Spanish rule. Right. Anyway. And they had been having so much trouble with the Spanish. I mean, that's why they were revolting in the first place. It just, yeah. they had no power. Right. To do anything about it. So on to yellow journalism. Yellow journalism and the yellow press are American terms for journalism and associated newspapers that have little or no legitimate well-researched news, while instead using eye-catching headlines for increased sales. Tabloids. So, quick paid of today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They usually include exaggerations of news events, scandal-mongering, or sensationalism. Again, sounds awfully familiar today. Yeah. And today it's used as a pejorative just to talk about any journalism that treats news in an unprofessional or unethical fashion. Joseph Campbell describes yellow press newspapers as having daily multi-column front page headlines covering a variety of topics, like sports and scandal, using really bold layouts with large illustrations, maybe color, which all sounds like every newspaper today. Well, yeah. But also heavy reliance on unnamed sources and unabashed self-promotion. I see. Some characteristics of yellow journalism. Scare headlines in huge print, often of minor news stories. <laughs> Lavish use of pictures or imaginary drawings. Use of faked interviews, misleading headlines, pseudoscience, and a parade of false learning from so-called experts. Dramatic sympathy with the underdog against the system. Also, interestingly... Emphasis on full-color Sunday supplements, usually with comic strips. This is how all that started in newspapers. So the origins are newspapers around 1900 in New York City. The major newspapers were battling for circulation. Joseph Pulitzer had the New York World. William Randolph Hearst had the New York Journal. So Pulitzer is the one who really started it. He wanted to make the New York World an entertaining read. So he filled the paper with pictures, games, and contests. I, mean, I think this is how we got like crosswords and all that stuff in papers. Yeah. He also put a ton of crime stories in his paper. So Hearst also wanted his paper to be as popular because this started selling really well. So his paper, The Examiner, devoted 24% of its space to crime. If it bleeds, it leads. Yep. <laughs> Just, oh. Yep. It's crazy. That's why people think the world is so violent today when it's less violent than it ever has been. Yep. They presented this, these crime stories as morality plays, included adultery and nudity by 19th century standards on the front page. Yikes. And Hearst became a war hawk, which is someone who is gunning for an actual war. Right. After the rebellion started in Cuba in 1895, he started writing stories about Cuban virtue and Spanish brutality, putting all over the front page. Based on nothing. Yeah, they were of dubious accuracy. Apparently, the newspaper readers of the 19th century didn't actually expect or really want pure nonfiction stories in their papers. There's not much of a citation there, huh. so I don't know if that's true. Hearst did this for two years and took credit for the war when it actually came. A week after the U.S. declared war on Spain, he ran the headline, How Do You Like the Journal's War? on his front page. <sighs> How could anybody be proud of that? I know. It's just gross. It's horrible. So, as with many of our degrees today, there was fallout from this. Later, Hearst ran for mayor and governor and even sought a presidential nomination, but lost a lot of personal prestige because there was big outrage in 1901 after a columnist named Ambrose Bierce and an editor named Arthur Brisbane published separate columns months apart that suggested that someone assassinate the president. <gasps> Whoa. And someone tried. So, uh, those were his papers yeah. that those columns showed up in. I can't believe he had any support even before that. He says he didn't know of one of the columns and the other one he pulled after it ran on a first edition. But the incident haunted him for the rest of his life and pretty much destroyed his presidential ambitions. Well, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so Pulitzer, while it didn't have any specific instances like that, he was haunted by his, quote, yellow sins. Ah. And he eventually returned his paper to the crusading roots it had started with. And by the time he died in 1911, 
the world was a widely respected publication. So he at least managed to turn it around. Well, and Pulitzer, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The Pulitzer Prize, yeah. you probably heard of. <laughs> We've made it through all six degrees. We had the Great Emu War, to nuisance wildlife management, to zoonosis, to the Spanish flu, to King Alfonso the Thirteenth of Spain, to the Spanish-American War, to yellow journalism. Rosanna, what did you think of the spiral? This was kind of a dark spiral. <laughs> It was, and there was a lot going on. War, plagues, terrible leaders. It was <laughs> it was just a mess. But the emus won. Well, kind of, until the bounties. Yeah, I was going to say. Not, not, not I so mean, much. I don't know if you can say there was a winner to the emu war. <laughs> this spiral had a lot of dark political history in it. Yeah. Of which I knew less than 1% of. So, <laughs> very educational. Thank you. It's time for Whim of the Week. Our Whim this week are common misconceptions. Rosanna and I have each chosen our favorite from a very specific Wikipedia article called Common Misconceptions. <laughs> <laughs> the first one I chose. Because this is a misconception that I have had, and it relates to the season of winter. In those with a common cold, the color of nasal secretion may vary from clear to yellow to green, but it doesn't indicate having an infection. I thought that the less clear your snot was, mm -hmm. <laughs> the more of an infection you have. Apparently, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Also, drinking milk or consuming other dairy products, does not increase mucus production. So you don't have to avoid them when you have the flu or a cold. Props to Rosanna for choosing the most disgusting <laughs> item on the entire list. <laughs> You're welcome. Here's another one. Your hair and your fingernails do not continue to grow after you die. Oh, yeah. It seems that way because the skin dries and shrinks away from the base of the hair and nails, giving it the appearance of growth. Like mummies. Ugh. Gross. Here's one. There is no evidence that Vikings wore horns on their helmets. <gasps> no! <laughs> that actually comes from an 1876 production of an opera by Richard <gasps> Wagner. No. That's where they started. Aww. They never had horns on their that helmets. That makes me sad. They should. I, I like the horns. <laughs> George Washington, our first president here in the U.S., did not have wooden teeth. What? No, no, no. It was far more disgusting. <laughs> His dentures were made of gold, hippopotamus ivory, lead, probably not so healthy, <laughs> animal teeth, including horse and donkey teeth, <sighs> and the worst, probably human teeth purchased from slaves. <laughs> Gross. How many teeth was he missing? So disgusting. So gross. Here's my next common misconception. Sharks <laughs> can have cancer. Oh. The misconception that sharks do not get cancer was spread by the 1992 Avery Publishing book called Sharks Don't Get Cancer. <laughs> Absolute <laughs> name. By I. William Lane. And <laughs> this idea was used to sell the extracts of shark cartilage as a cancer prevention treatment. Snake oil. Sorry, right? shark oil. Yeah, that's messed up. Here's a biblical fact for you. Okay. The the forbidden fruit mentioned in the book of Genesis that even Adam eat is never identified as an apple. Oh. Is it a pear? <laughs> Here's the thing. The original Hebrew texts mention only tree and fruit. Ah. There are early Latin translations using the word molly, which can be taken to mean both evil and apple. Jewish scholars have suggested that a fruit oh. could have been a grape, a fig, wheat, an apricot, or an itrog, which is a like lumpy citrus fruit. Yeah, oh, delicious. The fact that wheat is on that list is a little weird. I don't know who's biting into a piece of wheat. Also, it doesn't come from a tree. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah, very strange. The widespread urban legend that people swallow eight spiders <laughs> during their sleep <laughs> per year has no basis in reality. A sleeping person 
causes all kinds of noise and vibration by breathing and their heart beating and snoring. And that warns spiders of danger. So they actually just run the other way. They don't cr- climb into your mouth. I feel like that seems obvious, but I'm glad to have that reassurance. <laughs> Good to know. I'm not eating spiders every night. Yeah. Here's some science for you. Medieval Europeans did not believe the Earth was flat. Scholars have known the Earth is round since about 500 BC. Wow. This was actually a myth created very purposefully in the 17th century by Protestants to argue against Catholic teachings. Oh, for Pete's sake. Of course it was. <laughs> it's all propaganda. This is my favorite. You may have heard that carrots can help you see better, that beta carotene in them can help improve your night vision, and people that have a deficiency of vitamin A. This is completely untrue. <laughs> the best part is where it came from. The belief originated from World War I. It was British disinformation meant to explain the Royal Air Force's improved success in night battles. Which was actually due to radar and use of red lights on instrument <laughs> panels. They didn't want the other side to know about. So they made up this story about the, the pilots just eating more carrots. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's wild. It, as ridiculous as it sounds, it totally worked because people believe it even now. That is, I mean, that is crazy how things just continue to get perpetuated. Yep. And it's wrong. Rumors, just wow. rumors. All right, here's my last one. And I consider this common misconception for the truth of it to be very good news. The redhead gene is not becoming extinct due to oh. the gene for red hair being recessive, nor will the gene for blonde hair disappear. Oh. Although redheads and blondes may become more rare, they will not die out unless everyone who carries the gene dies or fails to reproduce. So wow. we're going to have redheads forever. That's really good news. It's great news. Like our dad. Like our dad. If any of our listeners read this article as well and find some cool common misconceptions that we didn't point out, we'd love to have you guys share them on social media. Yes. We'll put that out and we'll see what's interesting to you guys. And we want to say thank you so much to our patrons for supporting us and keeping us going. We really appreciate you. We love you guys. Thank you. That's our episode. Tune in next time for another Six Degrees of Wiki. Keep up with us at sixdegreesofwiki.com and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to let us know what you think. Looking for early access to episodes and bonus content like bloopers? Go to patreon.com to become a Six Degrees of Wiki patron and get discounts on merch or even help us choose degrees. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.